because it's a post-lunch session, I thought let's try and do something a bit more light-hearted, something a little bit different, but nonetheless, hopefully, will be a little bit interesting. Um, and at the moment, most of what we hear about in terms of food allergy revolves around prevention. So we've had the recent findings, particularly from this hospital, the EAT study and the LEAP study, where we now think that for many infants and for many young children, avoidance in early childhood is potentially unhelpful and actually from the point of view of allergy protection, prevention at least, early exposure might be helpful. And it's all about getting that thing right. And we've got to think not just food, but we also need to think how people might become allergic in the first place. And one interesting hypothesis for which there is a lot of data, um, let's see if I can get a pointer working here, which sometimes happens. Yeah, here we go. There's a pointer. Is this what we call the dual allergen hypothesis exposure hypothesis, and which was, came up with originally uh, or the main proponent being Gideon Lack based here, um, where it's this, uh, this idea that if instead of being exposed to a food at a particular time, at the same time as breastfeeding and so on, so the body learns how to tolerate it, you're exposed to that food through the skin because one has eczema, then the body develops an abnormal immune response and that's how food allergy might result. And that's, so at the same time as trying to think, well, we want to prevent food allergy, we also, also need to consider how we can reduce the impact of eczema and indeed prevent eczema. And some, there are some studies going on about that. However, there goes a question, if this works, will we all be out of a job before Andy gets to retire in 10 years' time? So let's just look at the LEAP data very quickly. And I don't expect you to be able to see that clearly. Unfortunately, you're not going to have to. I'm going to make life easy for you. So at the start, they started off with 800-odd patients, 800-odd infants under age 12 months. And then there was a group who already had a reasonably significant allergy skin prick test. And they were excluded and put into a separate study. And we know from subsequent publication that at least half of them end up with peanut allergy. So they're still going to happen. In the group who were skin prick test negative, now there's just over 500 of them, about 1 in 50 were allergic still, despite the early introduction. So it doesn't work in everyone. And in particular, in people who are already sensitized, they already have a weekly positive skin test, over 10% still end up with peanut allergy. So best case scenario, and this was a study where families were being contacted pretty much every week to say, how's it going? Are you getting the peanut in? You know, that motivational drive, which will never happen in real life. Particularly if you've, I don't know if anyone is sort of my age, you've been through the toddlers and kids running around. It, it's a bit of a crazy life to have. The last thing that often is the top of the priority list is, oh no, you've got to eat your two grams of peanut. Um, Best case scenario, we're still going to have peanut allergy. And the same holds true for eggs. So this is a study I was involved with colleagues in Sydney where we effectively we tried to see if early egg exposure can likewise prevent egg allergy. We published very recently. And again, when we started, and this is age four to five months, weaning generally hadn't even started yet in these children. Already almost one in 10 were allergic to egg and couldn't take part in the study as a result. So we're always going to have food allergy for the, at least the next 10 years, I'll tell you that much. And so I don't think we're all going to be out of a job, and I think we're going to carry on having meetings such as the one that the anaphylaxis campaign has organised today, because it's likely to remain a significant healthcare issue, although hopefully with the new prevention strategies we're working on at the moment as a community, it might become a less prevalent issue. But infant eczema is likely to remain a significant risk factor. And if we look at the trend in food allergy over recent times in this country, it's hard. It really, we've got very limited epidemiological data because it's really hard to sort of accurately determine, actually, does someone have food allergy? And are we just focusing on people who come to clinic? Because what about the people who don't get to clinic, the people who just get to see the GP, or perhaps don't even get that far and might have a very mild sort of food allergy that the parents clue on, OK, it's milk or something. We're just not going to give milk. And so it never progresses in terms of symptoms and severity. So we've got to look at surrogate markers instead. And if you look at the prescription of auto-injected devices, you can see quite clearly quite a stunning trend over the last decade or so. If we look likewise at hospital admissions, and one can assume that if you're admitted to hospital overnight because of food allergy, it's because you've had an allergic reaction. 
And probably that reaction was anaphylaxis, because you're unlikely to get admitted to hospital if you've just got a couple of hives or something like that. And again, you can see, particularly in children, quite a stonking increase over the last 10 or so years. And the question is, is that going to continue? What effect are these early interventions going to have on that data? But we're still going to have kids with food allergy. And as we all know, there is a significant impact to having a diagnosis of food allergy in yourself or in your child. It takes longer to shop, it costs more, because often the foods that are more likely to contain those allergens or may contain those allergens are the foods that are the budget labels. And so often you're shifted over to more luxury goods in order to, or at least your own perception, to provide safe food for the, the affected individual. Quality of life is worse. If you're a parent of a child with food allergy, you report a worse quality of life than if your child had diabetes requiring injections with insulin every single day, which is quite stunning for people who don't know much about food allergy. There's a risk of compromised nutrition in young children who are allergic to multiple food allergens, and of course there's a risk of a fatal reaction. And our perception is very much skewed towards headlines such as these, which unfortunately we're all familiar with. But actually, there is a question here, and I think there is an honest discussion to be had. Is anaphylaxis always this bad? If you have anaphylaxis, is this how you're going to end up? And there's some work that I know has been controversial in terms of how it's interpreted, but I think it's worthwhile just quickly reviewing this. This is work that Bob Boyle and my colleagues at St. Mary's led on, where he reviewed all the literature in terms of if you have a food allergy, what's the likelihood of something bad happening to you in any one year? And how does that compare to other bad things? And so we, Bob and the team looked at all the published data that we had. And we found that actually if, you have, if you're a teenager or a child and you have a food allergy, about one in 10 will report that they have an anaphylaxis episode during one year. If you went to see a doctor, actually only one in 10 of that one in 10 would you end up with the doctor going, yeah, I think you probably did. Because quite often, particularly in young children, you can have visually very severe reactions, very puffy, swollen face. Perhaps you can't even open the eyes because the eyes are so puffed up. But while it looks visually severe, that's not necessarily anaphylaxis. If there's no breathing compromise, if there's no cardiovascular compromise, it's just a severe skin reaction, visually severe. And then we get the opposite extreme, which also catches us out, where we can have a kid who often starts wheezing when they have coughs or colds. And when they start a little bit becoming a little bit wheezy because they've just eaten a snack that's got peanut in it or something like that, the parents go, well, they're always wheezing when they got a cough or a cold. They had a drubbly nose. And actually, that's anaphylaxis. But no, the parents don't spot it. And even sometimes in hospital, we don't spot it because, uh, you know, it'll be wheezy kids, maybe give a, bit, a few puffs of venting or something. And we have that time and time again, including my own hospital, where we hope we're pretty good. This happens in this hospital too, when I was working here. And it's a continual problem of, of people misperceiving the symptoms and missing and, and treating mild symptoms as severe and more concerningly severe symptoms as well they happen from time to time for asthma so that's all it is it's not a food allergic reaction but drilling on if you had an anaphylactic episode actually if it was bad enough to warrant a hospital admission that was about one in a thousand or less and then fortunately, although for about 10 people every single year this still happens, and that is 10 too many, the likelihood of having a fatal food anaphylaxis episode is actually pretty small, and it's less than the likelihood of you dying from other causes. That's not to say we can ignore it, but it is to say that not clearly, clearly not every single episode of anaphylaxis will end up in this group. And the problem we've got is that we can't predict who is most at risk. That is backed up, that data is backed up by this survey that was done back in 2012 in a number of allergy centres around the UK in teenagers, where we asked teenagers coming to clinic, what's happened in the last year? Have you had any reactions? And then the allergist, seeing that teenager, would decide was that a reaction or not, and was it anaphylaxis or not? And amazingly, 245 of them had a, had a reaction that involved a breathing or some cardiovascular symptom. And 83% of them did not use their adrenaline injectors 
often they did not use their Ventolin. They often locked themselves away. Because it's quite embarrassing if you're a teenager and you suddenly start feeling sick, you might vomit up, you look funny, you get, your skin goes blotchy. So they hid, which is the worst thing you could possibly do if you're having an allergic reaction. And nothing happened to them other than to come a year later and tell us about it in hospital. So clearly they somehow had managed to fix themselves. And the problem we've got is that we cannot predict who can fix themselves, who needs the adrenaline auto injector, or who might need a hell of a lot of adrenaline and fluids and God knows what else in hospital in order to fix a allergic episode. Fortunately, those severe episodes are pretty rare, but we can't predict who will have them, when they will happen, and so on. And so anaphylaxis isn't uncommon, but dying from anaphylaxis is very rare, particularly for food. But the problem is it's unpredictable. And we end up with this funny perception where we've got something that's quite rare and unpredictable, quite uncommon, but we're constantly bombarded with reminders of food allergy and allergens being present and being very ever-present and everywhere, with at least two-thirds of foods we buy in supermarkets having may contain labels. And now we're getting that situation if you go to a restaurant or to takeaway or something like that, because you have to disclose by law if there's an allergen present, and that's now shifted a whole load of may contain labeling in the catering sector as well to for whatever reasons, we can imagine what those reasons might be. And so people have the perception that because allergens are so common, and food allergy is pretty common, fatal anaphylaxis is common as well, but it isn't. And as healthcare professionals, one of the challenges is how we manage that perception and how we manage the anxiety appropriately. Because if we turn around and say to someone with a food allergy, well, your kid's got one million chance of dying, so what are you worried about? Apart from the fact I would never do that, and you'd probably get shot and sacked, well, I think you probably should. If that is our child, if someone's telling me as a parent that was my kid, actually, well, fine, it might be one in a million, but my kid's going to be that one in a million. I bet you bottom dollar that. And so it's a real challenge. That's one of the, the, the challenges of managing food allergy in real life. And the thing is that there's no current routine treatment for food allergy. We've got management strategies, but don't eat this is not a treatment. It's avoiding a reaction. Have an EpiPen or an Emirate pen is not a treatment. It's a rescue. It's a, it's a rescue treatment. It's something just in case the reaction happens. It doesn't help fix the underlying cause. Free from foods are improving, but they are still very different. And particularly in pediatrics, where you might have one sibling with multiple food allergies and the other siblings without, it does become a bit like that in terms of the restrictions that apply to one and how do you explain it to everyone else and the other kid wants to eat what the other one eats and we are getting consistently a lot of accidental reactions where the kid's fed up with what they want to eat and they will eat something that their sibling has instead thinking it's safe and so there is a huge psychology involved in terms of dietary avoidance so it's something that we've got to get right and it's something that clearly is the most important thing in terms of reaction prevention. Now, at the moment, allergen labelling is required under law, and the law has changed a couple of years ago. And if there is an allergen as an ingredient in pre-packed foods, it has to be declared. And now, also, in foods purchased from over the counter as well, although there are different ways that information can be transmitted. Of note, the allergen list varies from country to country. And while it's standardised in the EU at the moment, um, and I assume that will probably continue once <coughs> Article 50 is activated and Trump is no longer president in four years' time, then... <laughs> but there are some differences, particularly with respect when you travel to the USA as well, particularly for gluten. So that's, again, something that can cause confusion because it varies from country to country. But mandatory disclosure only applies to actual allergens as ingredients. And while it has to be declared if for foods that's purchased over the counter, and also the label has to look a certain way, so you're no longer allowed to say contains, that's illegal now. It has to be highlighted in actual ingredients so that people are sort of persuaded to look at the ingredients themselves. Nonetheless, we still end up in a situation where we've got lots of these things still may contain labels, which cause a lot of problem because if you go to supermarket, at least 70% of products will have one of those on it. And so it's really important at our end that we don't over-label people with food allergy, that we can make an accurate diagnosis. And our current testing is quite limited. This was a cohort of almost 3,000 one-year-old kids in Melbourne called the Health Nuts Study. 
And what they did is an unselected cohort, so it wasn't picking people who already come to an allergy clinic, it was picking the kids in the general population. And they looked at skin te allergy tests, and then every kid who might have been allergic got what we call a food challenge to prove actually are they really allergic or not. And you'll see from this that approximately for every two people with a positive skin test, only one of those kids actually had the allergy. And you go, hold on, Paul, what about egg? Now, they used raw egg for their skin test, which is associated with, um, and sorry, raw egg for their skin test and also for their food challenges. And a lot of kids this age will be allergic to raw egg, but otherwise tolerate egg in all other forms. So if you use raw egg for your food challenge, although quite clearly you're spotting everyone with egg allergy, you're also going to over-exaggerate probably what I'd call relevant egg allergy, because most people People don't feed one-year-old infants raw egg. And so actually, if you look at the kids who are egg allergic in terms of a scrambled egg or something like that, again, is around the 6 to 7% mark. So it will double the number of kids with a food allergy actually have a positive allergy test. And that's why people like Andy and myself and, and specialists and hopefully paediatricians have, and dietitians as well have a role to play because we have to interpret the testing. It's not something people should be filling in forms themselves, which sometimes happen if you go to the free from fairs that exist now and they'll offer you lots of tests. Sometimes those testing is irrelevant. Sometimes those tests are the right allergy tests, but you'll end up with what we call false positives. And so there's real pressure to try and improve the testing. Likewise, you've got a situation, if you're allergic to peanuts, should you actually avoid other, other nuts? Or just the peanut? And there's some data suggests that sometimes people with peanut allergy will start off then developing allergy to tree nuts. But then there's other data to suggest that actually, if you start to introduce tree nuts when you're not sensitized, that might prevent it. And there's studies going at the moment to try and work out which strategy is the best one. And in this data that was published from Leicester, of 94 peanut allergic children, one third had a positive test to a tree nut. But actually, only seven of 29 were allergic when they got challenged. So again, lots of false positives on the allergy tests that we need to somehow interpret. And if we say, well, actually, you need to avoid X, Y, and Z, but actually you might not be allergic, that has a massive impact potentially on your diet and with the level of restriction that you have to follow. So we need better diagnostics. And two diagnostics that are around at the moment that people are working on, the first component resolved diagnostics. And this is where rather than just measure the antibody to a whole bit of peanut, we can measure antibody, the Rg antibody, to specific parts of that peanut protein. And there are certain parts that seem to be associated with a, more like, with a higher likelihood of really being allergic rather than just having a positive allergy test, but really being tolerant to it. And there's a lot of hype and media about these tests. And there's a lot of pressure from the companies that make these tests to use them and how wonderful they are. But again, looking at the studies that have been done well, and this is the Melbourne study I mentioned, the Health Nuts study, what this is is called a receiver operating curve. And without wanting to give you a lesson in stats, and it isn't time, and that definitely will send you to sleep. In short, this is a, a statistical test that started off back in World War I and World War II when they wanted to look at how good people were at looking at early radar and spotting whether that really was something they needed to write about flying over London or was just a blip or a cloud or something like that. And they would look at people's hit rate for getting things right on the radar screen. So you're the radio receiver and it's your operating characteristic curve. It's how good you are. It's the sort of thing what we now call performance review. So if you do a performance review for the allergy test that we have, the best test would be a line going straight up here and then going straight across. If you've got a line that goes diagonally down the middle, that's as good as tossing a coin, heads or tails. So you want to head towards that far left corner. And the blue line is how good the blood test is for peanut. The green line is how good the skin test is for peanut. Clearly, it's a lot better. The red line is this new component blood test. But actually, it's the same, it's as good on this statistical test as our skin test. And so while it's a more expensive test, and it will pick up a couple of kids that the skin test will miss, the skin test will also pick up a few kids that this new blood test will miss. And effectively, they're almost as equivalent as each other. And that's for peanuts, which we have most data on, let alone all the other allergens, that there's very minimal data out there, really. So the first thing to bear in mind is at the moment, the new testing is better, but it's not necessarily the paradise that is sometimes market, it's marketed as such. 
The second thing is a basophil activation test. Now, a basophil is one of your white blood cells. And it's a cell that we think is probably involved in allergic reactions, and it releases histamine that causes some of the symptoms of an allergic reaction. And basically, the basophil activation test is where you do a food challenge, but in a test tube. So instead of feeding the person the food you want to see if they're allergic to, you stick that food in solution in a test tube with some basophils you collect from their blood, and you see if their basophils get a little excited. And the early data that is out there is showing that actually it's not a bad test in terms of spotting people being allergic. But again, it's early days, and it's potentially quite a complicated test. There are very few centres in this country who could do this as a research test, let alone as a routine test every single day, kids in clinic. The sample has to get from the patient to the lab within a couple of hours. You need quite an expensive machine in the lab and someone who knows how to use it. There are a lot of challenges in terms of that test then becoming something that we use in everyday practice. So we need another test. And at the moment, while there's a tendency to do food challenges, but we're a little bit worried because you might have an allergic reaction and we've got limited capacity in hospitals to do these supervised food challenges, there is data to actually show that to have a food challenge is actually a really positive experience, even if you react. Obviously, if you don't react and you're not allergic, well, that's great. But what we found, and I know, I'm sure this is Andy's experience from the peanut study he's been doing in Cambridge, certainly our experience in London, and it's been reported in Ireland and in America as well, that people who have reactions report a, less of an impact on their quality of life, irrespective of the severity of their reaction. And in London, one of the things that we do is when people have food reactions, if there's a whisper of anaphylaxis, we get them to use their adrenaline or injector for education purposes. And we thought maybe this might, you know, this might hurt, it might put them off, it might think, oh my God, every single time I eat peanut now, I'm going to have anaphylaxis, I've got to give myself a needle. And so one of the things that we looked at in our study is whether that has a negative impact on them. And actually what we found was not only is there no obvious worse effect, if at anything, there's a more beneficial effect. So interestingly, the children, everyone's reporting reduced impacts on their quality of life, but that impact, that reduction impact, is actually more, in some cases, for where, where those kids who have anaphylaxis and use their EpiPen, they're not. And the other thing we've looked at is what we call self-efficacy. How good is someone at managing their food allergy, at managing an allergic reaction? And here, quite astoundingly, there's a big improvement in self-efficacy in those with the red dots, in those who have anaphylaxis in a hospital environment, in a safe environment. So actually, while we might be able to replace food challenges in 10 years' time with the basophil activation test, I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing, because I think there will always be a role, in, particularly for people who are allergic, in terms of education, knowing the symptoms and knowing that actually the pens can work. There are some other techniques that are coming up, and just one that some groups are looking at is whether we can look at a mucosal challenge. So rather than make someone eat it, can we just put a blob of peanut butter on their lip or something like that, and then somehow monitor for signs of a natural reaction? And there is this technology um, coming up, if I can get the video working on this one, which can look at blood flow <coughs> at a very small level. So it's a very high-powered camera. And what you're seeing, these little dots dancing around there, are individual red blood cells within the capillaries in your lip. And one of the things that we see following an allergic reaction is increased blood flow. So potentially, with this sort of technology, you could see, if you suddenly start seeing that in someone who only had a little bit of flow initially, that could be, well, actually, you're positive. Yep, and this is something a test potentially could be done in the outpatient clinic. No blood tests, no specialised person. You don't need a courier to ship the samples for four hours. Don't need a whole six-hour food challenge or anything. Perhaps this is the way to go in the future. But meanwhile, let's get back to avoidance. So, what are we going to do with these things? Well, the problem is that these labels are all voluntary. Okay, While you, by law, can't mislead the public... There is no legislation in terms of whether the manufacturer sticks one of these things on their food product or not. And PAL, precautionary allergen labelling, may contain labelling. It can be useful or it can be very unuseful. It depends why it's used. So if, it's got, if there's a product with PAL, there might be a real risk there. It might be made on a shared production line, so there's Snickers and Mars bars, for example. And the owner of that production line has gone, there's a risk here, we've done our risk assessment, we're going to stick a may-contain label on. 
On the other hand, the manufacturer might go, nope, there's no risk. So we're not going to stick a may contain label on. But then the question becomes to the person who's buying the food, if there's no warning label on, does that mean it's safe or not safe? Because sometimes there's just no warning label on because the company can't be bothered to stick a warning label on. And we know that's happened in before. And what's not helpful is when no risk assessment has been done and the companies just stick it on to cover themselves. Or alternatively, and we're seeing this increasingly, particularly as European companies are purchased by American companies who are naturally a little bit more risk averse than we are in Europe. They've done a risk assessment. The risk assessment has gone, it's fine. But then the legal team goes, let's just stick a may contain label on. And again, we've got examples of that happening too. And when you're purchasing the food, you've no idea which box you're in when you have that food in front of you, which is why we say you have to phone them up, phone up the company, grill them, interrogate them. Now, hopefully, they have their 0800 numbers now, or 0500, or sometimes 0870 numbers, annoyingly. Do foods with power contain allergens? So there's various surveys that have been done around the world where they've taken a selection of foods from the supermarket and they've taken a bit of that chocolate bar or whatever it may be and they've gone, is there any peanut there? Can we measure peanut there? And there's lots of technical issues which I won't bore you with now, but the data seems to be relatively consistent that the majority of foods for sale that have a may contain label most of the time will not actually contain because of the allergen control that is practiced in those factories. There are a couple of exceptions, particularly this is the UK survey that was published a couple of years ago. Hazelnut often is found in cookies, particularly European, of European origin rather than UK origin. Oh my God, I sound like a Brexiteer, don't I? And so that's one thing to flag up to people with hazelnut allergy. And milk is a massive issue in terms of chocolate because when you are making chocolate, you can't clean chocolate machines with water. I don't know if anyone's ever melted chocolate at home. You get water in it, it ruins the chocolate. So the way you clean chocolate machines is with chocolate. And if you go to Bourneville, I won't mention which company, but you'll know which one company I'm talking about, you can buy those misfits. Those misfits, those sort of funny shaped chocolate things, often come from the cleaning runs that they use to clean the chocolate machines. But you can't really get rid of the milk if there's been milk chocolate down a production line. And that's why two-thirds of dairy-free chocolate still contains actual milk. And there's one company, one very well-known brand, that actually started listing milk as an ingredient because they could prove they can't get rid of milk from their dark chocolate line. And in America, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, turned around and said, you can't put that down. You're not adding milk. You cannot say it contains milk. And so they went back to using a May Contain label despite the fact they knew people ignored the may contain label. So there are certain things they really have to heed that may contain label. And so while most foods with PAL don't contain the allergen, some do. And some foods without PAL also contain the allergen as well. And when we looked further at that UK data from a couple of years ago, sometimes the risk of a food reaction could be quite high. So for milk chocolate up here, using modeling, known as Monte Carlo modeling, which sounds very exotic, doesn't it? Up to one in 10 milk allergic people eating that particular milk chocolate bar would have an allergic reaction were they to eat that bar. Dark chocolate, up to one in two eating occasions was a cause of reaction. And you can see some of the other foods up there as well. So it's not a necessarily a negligible risk. It's something that we need to consider. And so the reality at the moment is that there are wide inconsistencies in when companies put a may contain label on and why they might do so, and if they've done a risk analysis or not. But we're learning more about how to do risk analysis. We're learning more about allergen control. And it's often not just companies being lazy. Foods can get contaminated with allergens in the farm, in storage, when they're being transported to factories, when they're being manufactured and processed on shared equipment lines. And at the moment, the measures to reduce cross-contamination are not consistent. And there's a lot of work going on between science and industry, and particularly in the UK, the government regulators, to try and improve that. So I think probably things will improve in the future. And we're beginning to move over towards this sort of process where we can look at, oh, actually, how much do people react to? And that's a lot of, a lot of that data in the UK is coming 
coming from the TRACE study led by Andy, where we're looking at the amount that people react to in terms of peanut allergy and how that might vary from day to day and if you're a bit sleep deprived or you've been just gone for a run or something like that. And then we're comparing those levels to the amount of peanut which might be present and that then tells us, well, what's the probability that if you ate this bar you might eat it, eat it and you have a reaction and therefore actually do you need some sort of may contain label on that or not. And so watch this spot because things are improving. And in particular, there's a lot of technology beginning to come into the market through apps and so on, where people can actually, in real time, see what's the risk for me of this food item. Food allergy, intolerance, or specific dietary need, the Go Scan app makes it easy to source detailed and trusted product information via your mobile phone. My youngest daughter is allergic to eggs. The Go Scan app tells me if there are any allergens in it and if it's safe for her to eat. My husband has diabetes, so when I'm shopping, I need to consider the sugar content. And the ghost scan that tells me straight away what I need to know. We used to check protein versus carbs, which is really important on the train. He's not allergic. <laughs> <laughs> He's just Australian. Easy. You can search for products in one of three ways. Scan the product barcode, type in the barcode number, or search by typing in a product description. <laughs> there are eight categories to help you find what you're looking for quickly. Scan is developed by GS1 Australia in association with major so you get the idea. And there are lots of these apps now coming out, including apps that are linked to restaurant menus and so on. And so potentially this might really improve allergen avoidance. Although obviously the information the consumer will get totally depends on the information that gets fed into the database in the first place. So we've still got to get that right. But I think things are going to improve over the next 10 years for sure in terms of the information available to a consumer as to actual risk of allergen consumption. Can we end up with hyperallergenic foods? So not free from foods, but can we invent or can we somehow do something to peanuts or to milk, that means that you won't have an allergic reaction if you're allergic to those foods. It's not novel, we already do that for infant formula, that we can already process milk into hydrolyzed cow's based milk formula that most kids with milk allergy won't react to, that's how we manage milk allergy. So can we do that for other allergens? And there is a lot of work going on, not just for peanut, but also for wheat in terms of celiac disease, to modify the protein so that it's no longer recognized by the body and triggers an immune reaction. So again, watch this spot. Rescue treatment, what about that? Well, this is a massive issue because one in eight peanut allergic children will have an accidental reaction in every, any single year, an inadvertent exposure, whatever it may be. And over in one survey, over half of 500 infants had at least one reaction over a three-year follow-up, particularly if you were allergic to milk. And so you can be 99% good at avoidance, but that's as good as you'll get, 99%. It's really hard to get to 100%, and I don't think it's actually achievable. So we need to have a rescue plan, which is why every kid, and I'd argue adult, should have a personalised allergy management plan and rescue treatment as well. And within the UK, we've got these plans, at least for children, that we're trying to standardise, so it's quite clear these can be downloaded by healthcare professionals and by parents from the BSACI website, what the symptoms of anaphylaxis are, when you should use your adrenaline auto injected device, when you don't necessarily need to, what should prompt getting more medical attention or not. And what we need is better recognition, better management in the community, and appropriate management by healthcare professionals. And we're lacking in that at the moment. We know that one in seven teenagers report not really knowing when they should use their adrenaline pen or not. And it's not uncommon that when I'm doing food challenges and the kids, someone's had anaphylaxis, the family have gone, I would never have used the adrenaline pen at home if that had happened. We thought it had to be, <laughs> you know, the kid can be wheezy and breathing fast and coughing. Oh, that's not a bad reaction. That's not anaphylaxis. So it's again, under, telling people, to, to, trying to teach people what those symptoms are, which is where a food challenge can become so useful. We already know, and I showed you this data, that four out of five teenagers having anaphylaxis don't use their adrenaline pen. We also know that we're not that good as doctors or trainee doctors as well, as, as junior doctors. That this is an interesting study where we looked at anaphylaxis in a simulation using a mannequin that 
can get blotchy and can start moaning and getting wheezy. And only 50% of junior doctors and medical students in this study actually ended up using adrenaline when it was obviously anaphylaxis. And this was following teaching on anaphylaxis and allergic reactions. This study that was published in the States a couple of years ago, this follows a campaign with the College of Emergency Physicians in the States to say, this is allergies, anaphylaxis. You use adrenaline for anaphylaxis. And this was sort of singing and dancing. What they found, oh, it doesn't come up with the highlight. What they found, those who replied the survey, 93.5% correctly identified epinephrine, or adrenaline as we call it over here, as a thing you want to use for anaphylaxis. That still leaves 6.5% who, despite having completed the online education module, did not feel that adrenaline should be the first line choice for anaphylaxis. And only two thirds of those who thought it should be used the recommended route of an intramuscular injection. So clearly, there's a lot more work still to be done within the healthcare sector. And the study that, again, Bob Boyle and my colleagues at St. Mary's did, where we trained intensive training to mums of kids who had just been diagnosed with food allergy and were given adrenaline also injected device for management at home six weeks later after a 30 to 40 minute intensive training, not just two minutes in clinic, only four out of 10 could still use the pen correctly. Lots of people failed to remove the cap. They didn't hold it, they sort of plonked it on there, on, on, over the thigh, and then pulled it off straight away before the injection should be completed. 8% held the wrong end and tried to inject with the wrong end, which if it was an EpiPen, could actually result in the adrenaline going into your thumb rather than into the person having the allergic reaction. And we might go, oh, well, well, mums. But actually, we're not very good at that either. This is a study that a colleague of mine did in Melbourne in the Royal Children's Hospital, where only two out of 100 doctors, half of whom were consultants, could actually demonstrate using an EpiPen correctly. And 16 of them injected into their thumbs. And that was after they were told, here's an EpiPen, look at the instructions on the side, and now show me how to use it. And we're meant to be an intelligent bunch. <laughs> so there's clearly a lot of work still to do. And this is what we're trying to avoid. This is really bad anaphylaxis here. So refractory anaphylaxis. This is, what, this is from data from when we were developing venom immunotherapy about quite a few years ago. I think about this from six years ago. Someone in the anaesthetic room in hospital. Here he gets stung by the bee. And he, you can see what the blood pressure is doing. It plummets. And each little black square here is an intravenous adrenaline shot. And it's only when he gets then plonked on an adrenaline infusion that the blood pressure begins to fix. So if this happens to you, to food, in the community, one pen, two pen, three pens, ten pens is not going to do it. And actually what we need is for people to spot their symptoms, use the pen, and get to hospital as soon as possible. And sometimes I wonder, we focus so much on the pen, are you telling people about the symptoms? Because I don't think we are fully. And then finally, just to touch on immunotherapy for the last minute we've got, there is potentially a treatment in the future. There's a lot of work, much of which in this country we do lend by Andy, where we can now treat, teach the immune system to tolerate the food that you're allergic to. And there's studies going on for egg, milk, for peanut, and for other allergens as well. And we can achieve a success rate of 80% or so, typically. That still leaves 20%, however, who are not. And we are getting people who withdraw, particularly people who have, are more allergic, who react to smaller amounts, alternatively have much higher levels of, in their blood tests of the antibody. And so while it will work in some, it won't work in all. And more importantly, those people seem to require ongoing exposure. It's not like a six-month quick fix or a 12-month quick fix. You need to keep on regular exposure for years in order to maintain that tolerance. It's a bit like if you want to run a marathon. You can't just stop training and then expect to be able to run the marathon the following year. You need regular training, regular exposure in order to carry that on. And so the future, actually, doesn't look so bad. We are improving diagnosis. We're getting clearer labelling. There are apps around to help people with allergen avoidance. There might be hypoallergenic foods around as well. We need to work on recognition of symptoms. We need to improve adrenaline not to inject devices. We need to train healthcare professionals better as well. But why is it just plonked out? My computer's just given up the ghost. But effectively, 
much of those lists, much of the things that I've commented on, those things are already here. We can already improve education. We can already improve a lot of the things that we're doing already. And I, hopefully if this comes up on the list, it might not. We can already help people with a better diagnosis. We can already teach people better how to spot their symptoms. And we can already make sure people know how to use their adrenaline pens. So I'm going to stop there. And I look forward to telling you how we've done in 10 years' time. Great. Right. Right. Thank you very much, Paul. So uh, we've got time for a question or two. Um, any questions from the audience? No, nothing immediate. So, uh, Paul, just share with us some um, everyday clinical information. What do you advise a typical peanut allergic patient who uh, isn't sensitized to tree nuts in terms of products advice, pal labeling and uh, eating other nuts? Nice, easy question there. Yeah, yeah. So I think the important up. thing is, is there's no one size that fits all. And it depends on the level of understanding. It depends on the age of the kid, the family's understanding, how hectic things are at home. If, for example, I had a four or five-year-old kid and they're just allergic to peanut, they're negative to other tree nuts, often I will say, do you like chocolate? If they do, then I'll try and get Nutella into their diet only because if they're having regular hazelnuts, we know hazelnuts are often contaminant in biscuits and cookies, and if we can possibly prevent potential development of hazelnut allergy, or at least tick the box, they're not allergic to hazelnut, that can help significantly in terms of liberalizing the diet for those sorts of foods. But we need to be, you know, I'm, I, the number of challenges that I see where you've got a three-year-old who's been sent in for Brazil nut challenge. I don't know many three-year-olds who eat Brazil nuts on a regular basis. And I think the important thing is that you've got to pick the nut. You've got to think, how is this kid going to eat it in an age-appropriate way? Are they going to be able to keep it up? Do the family want to introduce it? There's no point in doing a food challenge because I think the kid should eat it. They've got to be, the family have to be on board as well. And in terms of the make on tame question, so having just written about a year ago an article about may contain and how we should be managing peanut allergy, again, I think there's a discussion there to be had with each and every family. There'll be some families where it may be appropriate, depending on the circumstances, that they eat foods that say may contain with appropriate safety netting because the impact of restricting those foods is so high. There'll be other families who are completely happy to avoid every single food that says may contain, in which case, that's probably a better thing for them because I might cause more anxiety if they say, oh, we could try it, but there's a one in a thousand chance you might react and so on. So it's, an, it's got to be an individualized decision that works for that family for that particular circumstance. I don't think there's one answer that fits all. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, I will say we are about to publish the BSACI NUT guidelines, which will address both of those issues. So it was a bit of a loaded question. Um, they should be out. It's an agenda. In the new year. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Thanks. <laughs>